Okay, hi everyone. So what we're going to talk about today is the beginning of historiography. And as you've been uh, looking at in your readings, we've started with the Greeks in particular with Herodotus and Thucydides. And what I want to do uh, in this slide or in this video is to uh, look through some of the predecessors of Herodotus and Thucydides and then go through in detail um, some of the, the questions that I've had you look at. So in terms of Herodotus and Thucydides, Herodotus is considered to be uh, the father of history. So if you have read parts of his histories, uh, you know that he can be pretty detailed on some things, and he's really considered to be one of the first. We know that he wasn't um, exactly the first one because he talks about some other people who influenced him, and I'll talk about that in, in just a bit. Um, if you ever get a chance to look at his entire book, it's probably published about that thick by Penguin today, so he wrote quite a bit. And he names his book Histories. And what I've done here, let me see if I can get the little pen to, uh, pen to work. He's named um, his book after a Greek word uh, meaning enquiry. So what he's doing is he's not just giving facts, he's talking about what we would consider today good questions to look at um, for writing a history, which is who, what, where, when, and why. And he ends up uh, doing this. Now, I'm going to mention a few authors that I did not have you read. So your main historiography book is by Popkin, which is a really good book. Um, a previous book that I used to use is one um, by an author named Brysock. And it's not, you don't have to go out and check out the book. You might be able to get it through the library, but it's not totally important. But um, he starts off his discussion on um, historiography, um, and in particular with Greek historiography, by um, examining something called the mythopoetic works. So what these are, a combination of myth, um, and in particular, he looks at the Iliad. And if you've taken any courses in Greek history, uh, you know that Iliad is probably the most important ancient history text uh, written by the Greeks. And it's a, a story about uh, the mainland Greeks who sailed to Troy, and I'm sure you've seen the movie Troy, some of that is true. But um, anyway, so what the Iliad really discusses, and what Homer discusses, is something that Brysock calls the disdain for the non-heroic, uh, meaning the focus of the book is on heroes. And this work had really influenced um, Greek history writing. So what you see throughout some of these early Greeks is um, a focus on the heroic past. And what this is ultimately going to mean is that a lot of historians, starting with the Greeks, going all the way up almost to the modern period, talk about heroes, or what we sometimes call big man history. Uh, the generals, the kings, uh, the male figures that um, supposedly played a big impact on their culture. So this is going all the way back to works like the Iliad. Um, Anyway, so it focuses on important people, and in particular, um, important events, namely war. So Herodotus is going to do the same thing. The Iliad is all about war and all about heroes. Um, and then there are also, if you uh, look through the Iliad, and again, you don't have to do that for this class, but as I put up here, the disdain for the unheroic. Now, the unheroic characters in the Iliad are the common people. So the, the foot soldiers, which you don't hear very much about. And again, what this ultimately does is it sort of shapes the course of history writing with a focus on the big men, the big generals, and not so much a focus on all what we might call the little people. Um, some interesting things about the Iliad that are not carried through into history writing, we'll talk about this in a bit, is that the Iliad is set to uh, a Greek meter and what that means, and we're not going to go through all this in, in detail, but when Greeks write poetry, there has to be stresses on certain words. So it's like um, if you're writing a line, and I'm not going to add words to this, but it's like de do do, de do do. So that's like a poetic meter. And so you have to find words that fit with um, those particular stresses. And it sort of limits what you can do with, with words. Now, in some cases, it works just great, like the Iliad, but um, that did not carry over. And again, I'll talk about this just a bit. Another thing that had a big influence on the writing of uh, Greek history in particular is the rise of the polis, which was 
um, the city-state. Um, uh, the, probably the most famous one is Athens. Another famous one is Sparta. Uh, people became interested in <clears throat> their own history of their city and then ended up uh, starting to write short histories of that, that area. Now, when you look at who influenced Herodotus and Thucydides, and in particular, we'll talk about Herodotus here, um, you've got um, another writer who was probably living about the same time as Homer, if Homer was a real person. This is a, a, a person called Hesiod. And again, what I've given you here is like page number eight. This is in Brysock. So again, it's not all that important. But Hesiod, when he writes um, works that are considered to be history, um, he saw history as a decline from high and low. And this is one of the things we'll be looking at throughout the quarter, is how do historians view the course of history? So in particular, Hesiod saw the ancient period as being a very important period. And as time goes by, um, people and ideas and things sort of decline after this. And when you look at his five periods, and this is what Hesiod ends up doing, he's got a, the golden age. And as I put here, there's no aging, things are perfect. And this is in the ancient, the ancient period. And then you've got the silver period, and then you've got the bronze and the age of heroes, which is coming down to the age of people. And then you've got the iron age, which um, for Hesiod, that was the time that he was living. So the age of the common man, you've got misery, injustice, death, and so on. So for Hesiod, time starts off in a good point where everything is perfect, and then as time goes on, things things get worse. And again, this is a pattern we'll be looking at for a lot of um, the historians that we'll be looking at. Um, another person that had some influence on um, Herodotus was Hecateus. And again, this page number is from, from Brysock. Um, what he tried to do, sorry, my cat is meowing, um, tried to link the past with uh, the present. And he tried to put together chronological lists. And one of the questions that I give you in the, the overview, the weekly overviews, is um, uh, thinking about how historians view time. So, and we'll definitely look at, at some of those things. Okay, so when you get down to Herodotus, we see that um, the writing has changed. So we talked about how the Iliad is poetry and how you're sort of um, uh, confined to the certain meters and certain words. When you get down to Herodotus, you don't have that restriction. He wrote in prose. And one thing I want you to think about, and I'm not going to answer this for you, is, you know, how does this affect the writing of history? Like, does it make it easier? Does it make it more difficult? Um, and so on. And as you can see from um, this other point on the slide with Herodotus, war was seen as a collective experience. So Herodotus is writing about the Persian War, which was a, a war between Persia and, and the Greeks. And when you start to take, about, take apart sort of general themes of the writing of um, history, and especially in Greek historiography, which starts at Halaf, you, you see that the writing of history and the historian must tell the truth. This is going to be the common point for all of history after that. And this is what separates history out from literature, where you've got um, historians trying their absolute best to tell the truth. Um, another theme in historiography is that it's written in a narrative form. And then another common theme, and you're going to see this throughout many of the, the historians that we're reading, uh, war is a common theme. Okay, in terms of answering these questions, so I'm not going to go through all of these um, uh, things in detail. So what I'm expecting you to do is to have your overview or your, your homework uh, in front of you as we go through and talk a little bit, little bit about this. So the first question I have for you uh, for the overview is, you know, when, when did Herodotus live? And then what might be going on to affect this person's writing of, writing of history? Um, in terms of when, Herodotus, we don't know the exact dates, uh, about 44 to 415. And, and this was right at the tail end of the Persian War and certainly right in the middle of the Peloponnesian War. Um, he was living in a town called Halicarnassus. And I mentioned this before, he had relatives who were writing history. So he mentions that his uncle was writing history. Um, he sort of has an interesting 
story behind him. So he was um, exiled. And this is going to be a case for some of these uh, Greek uh, history writers. And we'll look at this again with Thucydides, where he was also sent into exile. And this is probably the time when he started to uh, write his history. Now, there's quite a few things we don't know about Herodotus. But what he ended up doing is um, writing primarily about what happened um, before. And so um, he was writing about the Persian War, which happened before his, his lifetime. But that's what his, his topic was. And we'll see with Thucydides wrote about current, current issues. OK, in terms of the author's idea of history. So uh, these are questions, again, you'll be asking for every single historian. What's the purpose in writing? What events did the historian cover? Is it the historian biased, accurate, and so on? So you can normally find the purpose of the writing of a historian towards the beginning of the book. So if you look at book 1-1, of Herodotus histories, um, he gives this quote, and if I'm not going to read this to you, if you want to stop the video, you can certainly uh, read through this. Um, he also talks a little bit about his purpose in section 1.5, and another common thing he starts to do, and this will be the case through a lot of histories, he also writes um, to give a, a point of um, moral. So he talks about Croesus and so on, and especially that the rich are not the happiest people. Now, as we get towards the more modern period, we'll see that um, the inclusion of morality into a history is a really big issue. So we don't need to talk, talk about that uh, right now. In terms of events that he covers, um, I've given you um, part of chapter two to read. He covers natural history, sort of geography, plants, and so on. Um, he talks about sociology of different people. So he talks about the Greeks. Uh, the Persians and the Egyptians. Uh, this includes discussions on religion, war, personal conflicts, and so on. And the reason why we're going through these questions in, in a little bit of detail is because Herodotus is the first to write a history that we have the biggest chunk of. And he influences all the other historians all the way up almost into the, the modern period. So the way that he wrote um, affected lots of other people. Um, and so on. So as you can see here from the bottom, he doesn't really talk about the minor campaigns, only uh, those which were the most interesting for him. And again, this becomes a pretty common theme. Your only uh, historians from this period are talking about big man, big men and big, big things that are happening. Um, in terms of objectivity, so this is another important question to think about in terms of historiography. So you've got Herodotus in 1-2 saying this is according to the Persian count and the Greeks have a different story. So in general, people find that Herodotus is fairly objective. Like he's a Greek, he could have been um, uh, very sort of rah-rah Greeks one and you know and so on. And he doesn't seem to be like that uh, for the most part. He also likes to give uh, different views. And one thing interesting here, he says he has no intention of passing judgment on its truth or falsity. And he essentially is saying he's going to let the readers um, to decide this. Um, here's another quote from a book that I did not have you read. Um, a few years ago, I was having students read this book by Hofferly on historiography. And I will give you a minute to read through this. So the, probably the best thing to do is to stop the video and then read through this quote. So this is really important to remember about Herodotus. So he does focus on uh, political leaders and generals, but he also gives descriptions of culture. And in one respect, this we can sort of call, call, call cultural history. So cultural history as a theme in historiography was not picked up um, by a number of historians until uh, the early 1900s and certainly in the middle, late 1900s, where cultural history becomes a big thing. It's interesting that Herodotus's views of the writing of history are sort of skipped over. And, and part of that, in terms of cultural history, part of that is because um, Thucydides, who writes after Herodotus, didn't like some of the things that he was talking about. So Thucydides doesn't really talk about cultural history very much. And then for future historians like the Romans or the Christians and so on, they're not really talking about cultural history as well. So even though you have Herodotus, the first historian, writing about cultural history, uh, later historians skip skip that. Um, accuracy, this is a hard one to answer. 
um, especially if you don't know too much about Greek history. But at least we can say, and I didn't have you read this section, um, Herodotus is honest when he doesn't know something. So that can give us a little indication about the, the accuracy of his writings. So in terms of how he constructed his, his work, this is always important when you're thinking about historiography in terms of sources. And what I've done on this slide is given you uh, uh, some of the sources. And what I've done is I've just pulled these out of his works. So he travels around. So he uses his own experience. And you can see he travels to Egypt um, and all over. This can also give you an indication of his economic status. So one thing to think of, you know, could a poor person travel uh, to Egypt, to the Black Sea, to Italy? Um, uh, he sees the pyramids and so on. Um, he also talks to other people, which we could sort of call that uh, oral history. Um, he also gives different sources. So when he's looking at something, he will ask a number of different people and he'll give you two different um, accounts. And he also tries to use his own uh, mind to figure out what exactly was going on. Um, there's not, what's interesting, there's not a lot of textual sources that he's using here. And that's partly because uh, writing was fairly rare in the ancient world and there's not a lot available. So he's mostly going around uh, asking people, uh, using his own uh, eyes, and then trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Um, if you, and I, don't, I didn't ask you to do this, but if you happen to have bought the uh, Herodotus histories and the Penguin version, they give a nice structural outline of his entire work at the beginning. Um, I've already talked about this, so I'm not going to go over this too much. In terms of people who influenced him, certainly Homer. Uh, I mentioned Hecatius um, in uh, a previous slide. You've got a man named Dionysus and Miletus who wrote a few things. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of these works. We know a lot of the names. Uh, we know sometimes we know the size of these because later writers who are using them mention them, but then we don't have uh, the original. Um, I've all, I'll also, or I previously have talked about how um, uh, the histories are written in prose as opposed to poetry. Um, one thing too to note is that a lot of times Herodotus writes in the first person. So he says, I did this or I saw this. Um, th as I note here, Thucydides does just the opposite. And a couple of questions to, uh, to think about is, you know, would, would writing a history in the first person really make a difference? Um, one thing to also think about in terms of writing prose or poetry, can you write a history in poetry and what would that mean? Uh, what are the limitations? Maybe what are the, the benefits of doing doing something like that? So I'm not going to um, answer these questions for you, but it's something that you really should be thinking about. Another important part of historiography is thinking about chronology. So how do historians view time and how do they deal with how things are going? So in general, Herodotus looks at things in a linear fashion. So he looks at the older things first, and then he moves up to uh, the current things. Now, if you've read through Herodotus, you know that uh, he can sometimes make a lot of digressions, um, sometimes fairly long. He usually comes back to his point. Um, now, what he doesn't do is he doesn't attempt to tie a lot of these um, societies together with time, meaning he doesn't say um, in the year 1452, you've got this happening in Egypt and this happening in Persia and this happening in, in Greece. Now, uh, I just switched the side, but what I do want to say before I move on about this, um, partly what's going on here is that there wasn't a, a, a current calendar, like a universal calendar, like we use the Christian calendar in the ancient Greek world. What they tended to do was um, time was marked by um, the people who are ruling uh, the city-states or who are in charge of the city-states. So you could have a tyrant in one of the city-states, say Athens, and it'd be year one of tyrant. Kevin, uh, year five of Tyrant Kevin. However, you could also have another city state um, right next door that would also have another leader and they would number their their rules by that leader. So you can see when you've got over a thousand city states, all these different time things going on and then add to the, the problem of having a Persian calendar and an Egyptian calendar. They just didn't have the, the ability to think about all this. Now we'll see that Thucydides starts to um, 
uh, deal with the calendar issue, but we'll talk about that in just a bit. Um, some of the themes in Herodotus we've already talked about. Uh, war, power, retribution, and again, a lot of these things start showing up in uh, later histories because the, uh, Herodotus was one of the earliest to talk about this. Um, he wrote about freedom versus tyranny, so the Greek idea of democracy versus um, tyranny. And then, um, as I put down here, and I mentioned this before, Herodotus does a little bit of cultural history, but this isn't uh, picked up again until about the 20th century because a lot of the um, ancient medieval writers didn't think that it was uh, really important. I also ask you to think about speeches and why they're, uh, why they're used. So in Herodotus, if you look at the introduction, and again, I didn't have you read this, so it's not totally important to you know, find the penguin version, but if you have the penguin version on Roman numeral 29, um, you can see how that editor uh, gives this quote, characters defend their actions, reveal their intentions, and motivate others to act. Um, so one thing to ask yourself, did Herodotus hear these speeches? Um, and if not, how did he create them and why did he do this? So this is something we'll talk about when we talk um, about Thucydides in more detail. Okay, another very important question in terms of historiography for these er early historians is how does um, the role of the divine or supernatural play in human history? Um, I've given you a couple uh, uh, passages here from uh, directly from Herodotus. So you've got God is envious of human prosperity and likes to trouble us. So this is something that um, Solon says to Croesus. Um, there are predictions of things. Um, God makes people do some things. Uh, we also find in Herodotus the use of dreams and in particular the use of oracles. So you can look up these, these particular passages. And one thing um, to remember that's important about asking about the supernatural or the divine is how does the supernatural play into uh, directing the course of history. That's really what this question is about. Do you have the gods and goddesses like in the Iliad totally directing what humans are doing and what does that mean for free will? So what you see over time, and you can see this dark, um, in Herodotus and certainly in Thucydides, where the idea that the gods and goddesses are directing people and forcing them to do different things is um, slowly being taken out of the story of, of what humans are doing. This will directly be injected back in once we get to the early uh, early Christians. And then in terms of the other questions, so these are things that um, you can answer on your own. We've already talked about the influences. Um, think about for question six, um, in your opinion, who did the writer leave out? So, and what I've done is I've given you a little quote here to uh, to think about from uh, book one, section four. Um, this is just nothing worse than women stealing. The only sensible thing is to take no notice for it is obvious that no young woman allows herself to be abducted if she does not wish to be. So this is one, one clue about who um, a lot of these early historians leave out and it's women. Um, other groups of people who are being left out are the, the little people like the poor, uh, the slaves and so on. Okay. And then what I'm going to have you do is look through the rest of these questions on your own. What kind of message would the recipient receive? I've left you a few notes here. You can certainly stop the video and look through this. Okay, let's move on to the next person we're, we're talking about, and that's Thucydides. And we'll do the exact same thing. I'll go through over uh, some of the main points and then certainly be comparing these to your overviews. Uh, Thucydides, born around 460. Um, he was exiled in four... 24 and what happened here is that Thucydides was an Athenian general and he was sent to a city-state called Amphipolis to defend that city-state during the Peloponnesian War and he didn't do it so that the Spartans came in and, and took the city and after that the Athenians sent him into exile and this is when he started to write his history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, we're not exactly sure when he um, he died um, when you start the beginning of the Peloponnesian, history of the Peloponnesian War, it officially starts in 431. Um, he refers him to himself in the third person, so I mentioned this earlier before with Herodotus. He talks, uh, Herodotus mentions himself as I, I, I. Um, and this is important. So in terms of Thucydides' idea of history, 
and what's the purpose? So again, you can look towards the beginning of the writing of Thucydides. My work is not a piece of writing designed to meet the taste of the immediate public, but was done to last forever. So this is a pretty big purpose in terms of writing what he, he does. Um, what's he writing about? He's writing about the war between Athens and Sparta. Um, one thing he does say is he didn't want to write about the distant past. And I want you to think about this. So do you really agree that um, um, historians like Thucydides should not write about the distant past, and why um, why shouldn't they? And what I've done here is I've given you a quote from 1.1, 1 .1, um, History of the Peloponnesian War. So what I want you to do is to stop the video, uh, read through that particular passage, and think about what that means in terms of writing about ancient history. Um, he also said um, in 110, we have no right therefore to judge cities by their appearances rather than by their actual um, power. And I've given you again some, some quotes that if you didn't pick them up in your homework, you can certainly in your overview, you can certainly um, stop and go through Thucydides and see and look through some of these um, passages that I've given you. So Thucydides thinks that history should be useful. So it should be useful to the audience that um, happens to be reading it. And one in particular thing is he describes the plague. I don't know if it's in the section that I gave you, but uh, later on in the history of the Peloponnesian War, he gives a history of the plague because he ends up catching it. And so he talks about what it's like to be sick and so on. And he does this in hopes that someone can actually, uh, when the plague comes through again, uh, figure out um, a way to treat it. Um, one thing to think about, does he have a moral to his history? Um, and if so, uh, what is that? And as you can see from this quote in Hofferly, uh, political forces for Thucydides were the driving force in history. Um, do you really think that's the case? Um, something to really, uh, really think about. Okay, so how does the author construct his work? Um, what are the sources? Is this story critical, chronology, speeches? Um, if you look at section 122, Herodotus says he didn't just accept the first account that he heard, and this is very much like Herodotus. Um, you've got, in terms of sources, um, he uses his own eye, so Thucydides is traveling around and he's talking to people who are fighting in the Peloponnesian War. Um, he does criticize Herodotus quite a bit in this, this particular writing. Um, he knew chroniclers. Now, chroniclers are people who just write like, in this year it rained, and the next year it was dry and so on, and he ended up dismissing these. Um, he did read a few inscriptions and he was using these, and um, if you look at section 220, two he says, and they say that. So um, in terms of speeches, probably the most important thing to remember about Thucydides is that he does use speeches throughout his writing, and what's really interesting about these speeches is that um, he was not personally present for some of these speeches, but he felt it was totally acceptable to write a speech in the words of, um, in the mouth of somebody, as long as it's what that person would have said. So um, you can see in section uh, 122 where he says, in this history, I've made use of set speeches, some of which were delivered just before and some during the war. So he heard some and then he, he uh, put words in those characters' mouths, as long as it's what they would have said. And this becomes pretty acceptable in the writing of history. It wouldn't be acceptable today, but it was acceptable then. Uh, chronology. So remember in Herodotus, there was quite a few difficulties with, with chronology. So Thucydides starts to make this a little bit easier by talking about the years in the war. So the first year of the war, the second year of the war, um, he further divides this by seasons, and you can see this in 2.2, where he talks about in the spring, the summer, the winter. And as I put up on the slide, this is fairly new. Um, there are lots of problems with dating still during this period, and you can see this in uh, the writing of Thucydides, where he's trying to uh, correlate what's happening in numerous city-states all at the, the same time. Um, supernatural, you can see a little bit of the supernatural being being mentioned in the writing of Thucydides. Um, there are earthquakes, droughts, famine. Uh, he does mention the Delphic Oracle. Um, but in uh, for the most part, 
we see that the divine or the role of the gods and goddesses is taken out of what's happening um, during the time of Thucydides. Now, he does mention things like fate, um, where there seems to be maybe a religious undercurrent to his writings, but it's not, not very clear. Um, okay, so what I want you to do is the rest of the questions on your own and to really start thinking about the differences between Herodotus and Thucydides. Um, do you like more than one? Um, um, and really think about why, because what that does for you is it makes you think about the style of writing. Um, one thing we'll be looking at towards the end of the class is uh, where you think you fit as a historian in this sort of stream of historiography. Um, and right now you can think of, are you writing your history more like Herodotus, uh, more like Thucydides, um, and think about why. Okay. So that ends our discussion about um, the Greek writers.